This is the recording of lecture number 10 for the Geology 2017 Geology for Engineers course. So in this lecture we are going to review some of the uh, very large intrusions uh, of basic composition that we find uh, in some of the characteristic uh, cratonic settings. Uh, um, so we will see that we have uh, very large igneous bodies that form pretty much everywhere on the planet uh, and they are mostly associated with those hot spots that uh, we mentioned when we were discussing in earlier lectures uh, the uh, Hawaiian volcanoes for example or the continental fl flow basalt provinces of uh, the uh, cascade ranges so those are some examples, but we have cases in, in which these ultramafic ultra or mafic bodies um, tend to be extremely layered and uh, uh, they are quite quite unique also because from the standpoint of, of hosting significant, significant amounts of, of mineralization. So if we move on and we start to sort of consider some of the main ones uh, we can see really the largest uh, are the first three there so the bushwell complex uh, the dufek uh, and and duluth they have variable ages uh, in terms of um, their formation age uh, we talk about mostly precambrian deposits so these are quite ancient uh, uh, um, mineral accumulations and, and also magmatic accumulations um, and in a way they are somewhat similar to the very large magmatic chambers we have already reviewed uh, when we were discussing about mid-oceanic ridges uh, so a lot of things will be very similar so for example this style of fractionation of the magmas is somewhat uh, similar to the tolaitic uh, examples we, we already discussed for, from the standpoint of, of understanding how uh, the mid-oceanic ridges uh, produce crust. So we saw that they emit a very large volume of tolaitic basalts and we saw the extensive plateau that formed in Iceland, those are very similar to these ancient uh, uh, flows that are plat plateau-like uh, and they can extend in some cases for hundreds of kilometers uh, in uh, uh, diameter. So the Bushwell is a good example of that. It exceeds the hundreds of kilometers uh, and in fact it does have an overall area uh, that is roughly on the order of 66,000 square kilometers. Uh, very close in size to Dufek in Antarctica, uh, which is on the order of 50,000. And then we go one order of magnitude uh, lower and also two orders for these last uh, two examples. So the Kiglapite and Skyguard intrusion, which is even younger, so we have a very young intrusion here, Eocenic, so it's a Phanerozoic intrusion. So we will review today some elements of Bushwell. So this very large intrusive have some characteristics that is worth learning, and also look at the Stillwater complex and the Muscox. Uh, intrusion as well and uh, uh, some some illustrations also of the sky garden its variation in composition and structure will be part of of this lecture so if you look at the distribution of uh, the major uh, mafic to ultramafic layered intrusives uh, uh, geographically we can see they have a broader distribution they occur pretty much across the entire globe in all the continents so these are continental things we find them preserved in cratons in most cases and 
they occur in uh, different crust from the standpoint of the uh, age so mostly are in, in Archean Craton so you can see these darker sort of polygons here which represents the North Northern Can Canadian Shield with uh, a lot of Archean and, and Proterozoic rocks uh, present uh, but yeah do not forget that we have also some uh, Phanerozoic examples as well which are relatively young so we'll see the sky guard here in Greenland today and uh, also talk about a little bit about some of the texture of um, some of the cumulites we find in these intrusions and we will take the ram uh, intrusion as an example other things well if you look at the size of these uh, intrusions we see very large bodies in uh, uh, Archean cratons but also very large bodies in Phanerozoic uh, sequences so the size is not strictly related uh, with uh, the um, age of, of formation uh, but on the other hand we can see the distribution is dominantly in this Proterozoic shield, so we have little intrusions uh, in, in uh, these more recent Phanerozoic times. Uh, so perhaps this uh, is linked with uh, the evolution of differentiation of the planet. Uh, so in the early stages uh, of differentiation, when we were forming early crust, uh, so these are the oldest also parts of continents. So we go for sure to uh, ages that are older than, than the billion year for these assemblages, uh, so the darker ones. Uh, so these will be fragments of, of really ancient crust, basically, that are preserved within the continents. Uh, so if, if we preserve them and we find that the majority is, is really linked to this old crust, uh, certainly that could be an indication that uh, we have uh, that the majority of the heat dissipation and energy dissipated during differentiation and plume-like uh, uh, tectonics may have contributed to the formation of these uh, ultra-large intrusions. Uh, so layered intrusions are not exclusive of Archean times, uh, but they were heavily distributed and formed uh, in more uh, in a higher number in those periods. Uh, Okay, so let's see if we can uh, understand other things about uh, these uh, bodies. Uh, so and you have a very simplified diagram here, so the funnel-like uh, um, supply of magma. So we have a very uh, sm small channel that represents a fissure in, uh, in the crust, uh, uh, which will transfer the magma, and then the magma tend to accumulate uh, in... Uh, a very extensive and thin uh, intrusion uh, which is uh, usually lens shaped uh, and it will crystallize uh, quite deep in the crust if you remember we we know that the composition of, of the magma will equilibrate with the surrounding host so we have relatively high densities uh, so they, they will be on the order of three for ultramafic uh, uh, magmas. Uh, and so we tend to have that uh, mostly they will sit again at uh, the uh, boundary between the crust and, and the upper mantle in most cases. Uh, so it's, it's very similar to what we saw as a process for magma ponding in uh, subduction related magmatism. But in this case, these intrusives, uh, since they are likely linked to hotspot activity, they are not really governed by continental margins, uh, so they can form in any uh, position, and so they can be also intracratonic or inter intercontinental and also intraoceanic as well. Of course, the best map that we have are the ones that are exposed in crust, uh, and uh, they are uh, likely the easier that uh, you can detect as well. So they consist mostly of individual uh, 
layers so layers is an important keyword so all these bodies tend to be heavily layered and this is a magmatic layering is not a sedimentary layering that's an important uh, distinction to make so the there is uh, bedded uh, um, deposits but these beds uh, are formed through magmatic processes uh, and so we will see that they have different characteristics that can be relatively relatively coarse or fine grained and they will have a different uh, composition that can be mafic to ultra mafic and so you have all those rocks that we have classified extensively already so pyroxenites dunites gabbros all those rocks really are a characteristic of this uh, layered intrusion related complexes there will be also felsic units this will be anorthosites so nothing new we have that ternary diagram or the bowen sequence in the really early stages of crystallization will be fundamental for understanding the associ mineralogical associations so we do have that we, we, we tend to have those three classical minerals, pyroxene, plagioclase, which are the anortite variety in this particular case, uh, and also the olivine, of course. Uh, the additional aspect of uh, ultramafic uh, layered intrusion is the relative abundance of transition metals such as nickel, chromium and copper and also uh, the PGEs so these are the platinoids uh, and uh, they are precious metals uh, so they are particularly sought because of that and uh, it's somewhat similar to what we find uh, here in Sudbury in fact at the end of this uh, lecture we are reviewing Sudbury and sort of look at the unique structure that we find but the mineralization found here it's commonly represented by nickel copper and, and pg deposits uh, the complexes will vary in size as we saw so usually bigger deposits are better the bushwell complex uh, is so extensive that as virtually unlimited accumulations of, of chromitites which are those layers that contain a lot of chromite and associated magnetite as well as those platinoids and uh, nickel and copper um, so certainly size will help you in terms of mineability as well and the continuity is also this of these units is exceptional as well So usually the PG chromium intrusions also will be generally larger than, than the copper nickel intrusions. Uh, that's also an important character to, to remember. In terms of the ostrox uh, uh, for the sulfides and uh, platinoids, we, we commonly have uh, an oxides that we find in this uh, assemblage. We, we tend to have again mafic and ultramafic rocks so it will be mostly a question of having layered gabbros and peridotites uh, uh, present so all these varieties will have different composition in terms of proportions of pyroxene olivine and plagioclase felspar so the calcium and sodium rich varieties will uh, represent important distinctions uh, in the uh, stratigraphy of these um, igneous bodies one example is uh, the uh, muscox intrusion uh, this intrusion is uh, particularly known for the funnel shape uh, geometry uh, and so it looks pretty much like a martini glass uh, which has you know on the stem you have the feeder system here that supplies uh, picritic magmas so do we have basalts that are 
extremely rich in magnesium. We mentioned picrite quite a bit when we were uh, comparing uh, so ultramafic, different types of ultramafic rocks in earlier lectures. Uh, and so this will be similar to comadiites in a way. Uh, so relatively magnesium rich melts uh, that uh, represent uh, the initial sort of supply of magma and then we have different layers which have a variable level of fractionation so they intrude uh, into a granite uh, so the uh, basal rocks are a combination of meta sediments and granite so on this side you have granitic rocks uh, and on this side you have mostly meta sedimentary rocks uh, so we haven't done metamorphic rocks uh, as yet but you can think of them as uh, sedimentary rocks that have been uh, def uh, deformed and uh, they had a change in pressure and temperature that uh, render them metamorphic uh, so these are transformed sedimentary rocks uh, and uh, yes the key important aspect is really the layered series here so we commonly start with you know dunitic rocks or rocks that contain quite a bit of olivine will be uh, the first uh, to fractionate commonly at the bottom of the magmatic series uh, and then usually that's followed uh, by uh, intervening levels uh, of pyroxenite so we have uh, phases in which we tend to crystallize more pyroxene than olivine and uh, we have however very little plagioclase in these early phases so we go from you know dunitic to peridotitic compositions that have have very high amounts of um, pyroxene in them. Subsequently, uh, we tend to have a migration into more fancy assemblages, and so we go into the uh, gabbros, granogabros, and granophiles, so rocks that show quite a bit of immiscibility. If you remember, we mentioned graphic granites uh, as an example of coexisting of felspar and quartz. Uh, granophiles are very similar. It's another way of describing a similar process in which you have exolutions uh, of plagioclase in this case uh, and also some of the um, other felsic phases that, that commonly are, are associated which will be the more alkalic uh, felspars. Uh, so granophilic uh, rocks uh, will be found really at the uh, top of the sequence so you have uh, most of them concentrated on this uh, part uh, which is still preserved uh, of, of the um, muscox complex and, and, and also there is another uh, sort of culminating uh, this uh, layered sequence another level here of, of granophiles uh, so the Granogabros will be very similar again, so you do have uh, these characteristic exolutions that, which indicates you know, the abundance of hydrothermal phases uh, usually uh, contributes to uh, the formation of these uh, type of assemblages. But the key idea is very simple. We tend to have a progressive fractionation, so we find more felsic rocks like verlites at the top of the sequence, so uh, mostly clinopyroxen rich rocks. Uh, uh, instead, at the bottom, we tend to form orthopyroxenites uh, and also combine that with dunites, uh, so more immature rocks, which are uh, pretty much similar to those Habsburgites that we were mentioning in earlier lectures. Uh, Okay, so very similar concepts. Uh, how do they look like? Uh, well, very often these layered uh, ultramafic complexes will have uh, pretty neat boundaries. Uh, so these are commonly um, very sharp. So you can see easily a transition from uh, anorthositic, for example, plagioclase-rich uh, um, magmatic rocks uh, 
Okay, uh, resuming this discussion, we were talking about uh, the layering. So we can see here uh, a centimeter scale layering uh, of uh, relatively mafic assemblages and felsic assemblages that form um, repetitions in, in uh, the distribution of this uh, um, different modal mineralogy really so we start with a very thick layer of anorthosite so remember anorthosites are plagioclase rich rocks and the variety that is particularly calcic because these are again coming off ultramafic magmas so we drop anorthosite first and then we have a change in uh, the conditions within the magmatic chamber and we tend to form more mafic assemblages so you might have an influx of, of ultramafic magma from from the bottom uh, that will contribute to uh, this type of uh, layering so sometimes uh, what produces the layering is really external supply of magma so you start fractionating the rocks uh, um, by uh, producing mostly mafic assemblages and then the fractionation progress and produce more felsic assemblages so the anorthosites uh, but then you have in a pulse of uh, uh, primitive magma that enters into play and you start forming these more uh, mafic assemblages again and again and again so if for what are called rhythmites in some cases if they're very regular in this case we can see that they have a different thickness so that's probably not the best term of describing this i would just say that these are layers of uh, different thickness but uh, pretty much constant compositions the darker part will be commonly called chromatites so chrom chromatites are are almost entirely composed of chromites which is a type of spinel so it's very similar to mag magnetite but chromium rich and uh, um, they will contain also magnetite uh, sometimes and, and also they contain uh, sulfides uh, which are common so nickel copper sulfides and also attached to those sulfides we will find uh, uh, sometimes the PGEs so platino platinoid group elements uh, which is very very important uh, for, for a variety of industries but mainly for the uh, technolo technology sectors so, so electronics uh, will be a heavy user of, of platinoids uh, and also of course for jewelry production so this is again an example from from the bushwell complex uh, this is uh, one of the sort of leading chief chief localities for uh, the uh, chromatites and also for for these uh, layered complexes uh, here is an illustration of what i was mentioning so the chromite can form these um, layers that uh, are almost entirely composed uh, by this chromatic material and uh, you if you look carefully you can recognize some of the octahedrons uh, that are uh, representative of eohedral chromite and so all this assemblage will be a chromatite because it's the rock that contains uh, more than 90 percent chromite this is how it's turned and uh, the remaining percentage which is really little is represented by these yellow domains uh, which are the sulfides so you will have uh, classic sulfides such as pentlandite so nickel sulfides and, and also copper sulfides so chacopyrite can be present uh, together with uh, uh, the platinoids which in this case are attached to the sulfides and are find uh, as blue blebs uh, in this uh, three-dimensional model that is illustrating it's, it's essentially a cut scan so we use x-rays uh, to image uh, the different density of, of these minerals uh, 
So you can isolate, for example, in this case, we see both the chromatite and, and these blebs of sulfides. If we remove the, the, the chromite part, we, we are left with this small percentage of sulfides and even smaller percentage of platinoids. Interesting to see that the platinoids like to stay very close with the sulfides. So sulfides, which are more abundant, can be a vector to identify the platinoids in some cases. So we have different type of layering in uh, uh, ultramafic complexes. Uh, we can have uniform layering so many times, like the example we saw before, you will find pretty much consistent uh, mineralogy across very extensive distances. And in fact, uh, some of those um, horizons, uh, like chromatites uh, in the bush, well, are, are commonly called rifts uh, because they are extremely continuous. Uh, they can be traced for, for really hundreds of, of kilometers in some cases. So, so we could make the example of the Merensky Reef uh, in the Bushwell complex. So, so very extensive, a use, use, useful guide for um, mapping out uh, the uh, distribution of mineralization across the deposit. Uh, other cases uh, instead are more non-uniform. They, they can vary, so you will have changes in thickness, changes in grain size, all sort of variations may, may occur. So if you have uh, graded uh, cases, uh, you will get a gradual variation, uh, which is commonly um, either uh, a mineralogical transition or a grain size transition. So size or mineralogy will represent uh, a variation and that can be either very sharp, so non-uniform, or it could be graded, so you have a transition in mineralogy or grain size that uh, represent your layers. So, so some examples of uniform layering here, uh, we do see in this uh, representation from the Skyguard intrusion in East, uh, East Greenland, uh, which is again a very small intrusive, uh, that is heavily studied uh, because it's all exposed. Uh, of course, not in winter, but when, when it's summertime, all the ice uh, get gets melted, and, and it's possible to access uh, the outcrop surface that has exposures of of the Skyguard intrusion, which is quite quite exceptional exposures. You can you can see things like this. So. A transition from from uh, disseminated uh, plagioclase, so anorthosites, into more pyrox and rich uh, layers, and you have an enlargement of, of these uh, relatively continuous uh, uh, accumulations. So these are cumulates. Uh, so you tend to recognize them because you have crowded textures like this, in which all the crystals of uh, Fespar are uh, sort of um, compacted together and uh, they form this very um, cumulophilic texture, you know, so they, they tend to form these cumulates uh, and interstitial to that you have other minerals, uh, so you can get your pyroxene or, or olivine many times uh, in, the, in the structure or, or texture of the rock. But yeah, pretty much homogeneous so across a layer, you will find pretty much the same uh, thickness and same grain size and same mineralogical composition. And then you have a sharp transition and you form another layer which will have a different mineralogical composition, but you don't get a clear-cut transition. Uh, so these are definitely uniform layers. Uh, Other types of, of layering, commonly we call modal layering. Uh, it's the case in which you, you have pretty much a constant uh, uh, mineralogy. So you have all the minerals uh, that are commonly found in those rocks will be present. Uh, 
and uh, it's more the relative proportions of, of these mean acids that will change. So if we have plagioclase, pyroxene, and olivine, they will be always there, but you tend to change their proportions. And, and so you, you have essentially a variation in the modal mineralogy of the rock, and this is why you call it a modal layering. So you might drop, for example, some of the olivine and increase the amount of plagioclase and that's how the composition will dictate uh, uh, the layering you observe. Phase layering is rather related to the appearance or, or disappearance of, of minerals. So it's the same concept, but you lose completely one of the minerals. So you might have gabbroic assemblages that don't have any olivine in them. And so they are more noritic, for example or uh, pyroxenites, uh, which will lose completely the plasmoclase and uh, the olivine. So those are nice examples of phase layering. So we saw for the muscox, uh, we have uh, thin layers that contain exclusively pyroxene. Those are a good fit uh, if we could classify them as phase layering. Cryptic layering is even more complex. You will never really see it in outcrop. It's more uh, a question of substitution. So we saw that Garnet, uh, for, for example, Olivine, which is a better fit for these rock types, uh, will, will change its uh, composition. So we have substitution of magnesium and iron into the structure of the Olivine. Of course, harder to detect these uh, substitutions, uh, uh, but uh, uh, it's really important to realize that it's possible to analyze chemically the rocks. Uh, and so you'll be able to um, understand the cryptic layering and uh, essentially uh, witness uh, the variation in composition of, of olivine, for example. And this is quite, uh, quite uh, instrumental when you're trying to reveal uh, the history of fractionation that, that occurred. So, for example, we have that more immature melts will, will tend to have more forced theoretic compositions of, of the olivine, so they will tend to have much more magnesium. And then you end up with fractionated magmas that have more phyolytic compositions, so the olivine gets more enriched in iron, essentially. So remember, the variation in chemical composition of certain minerals uh, is uh, commonly uh, referred to as a cryptic uh, layering because it's difficult to, to see and detect unless you have chemical analysis available. Some examples of, of graded layers here. So we mentioned that uh, Sometimes you get grating, so you see here major crystals of olivine in uh, um, olivine. This is olivine and uh, plagioclase, uh, which will gradually sort of change uh, in, in composition. And so we go from olivinic or dunitic composition. So sometimes olivine can be goldish in color like this. Uh, and you move into more pyroxene and plagioclase rich uh, layers here. So this could be your gabbros. Uh, so these are very coarse, coarse gabbros. Uh, and here you can see how the grading progressive. So you have been dropping large crystals of uh, so which were the first to form uh, of plagioclase and uh, a mixture of olivine and also pyroxene, and then you move into troctolytic compositions that are dominated by white plugs of plagioclase and green plugs of, of olivine. So that's your um, the best example of troctolite. Uh, that's your gambros, and these are likely dunites. Uh, in this other example, you see a grain size variation even better. This is, I think, uh, from the Duke Island uh, intrusive complex so, so it's a combination of orthopyroxene and plagioclase so remember by orthopyroxene we refer commonly to the uh, bottom of the triangle of the classification of of pyroxenes um, so it's the family of 
enstatite and ferrocylite, those are commonly classified as orthopyroxens, uh, and they tend to be uh, found in uh, um, rocks that are relatively primitive, so lerzolites or uh, asburgites will contain uh, these minerals uh, dominantly. So here the orthopyroxene uh, has some magnetite and it's represented by these darker layers uh, and so the whitish instead is more the plagioclase so we see coarser plagioclase that gets fine enough uh, in the sequence which illustrates different cycles of, of uh, segregation of, of these uh, um, felsic and mafic uh, assemblages uh, so a very nice example of how rhythmic is in this context the crystallization and how it's controlling the variation in grain size. Uh, so it's not only a question of composition, uh, you can get uh, um, relatively neat transitions also by looking at the grain size of the crystals. Uh, uh, here is a, a microscopic example, so we look at uh, thin sections and we use a quamp scan approach which can color the different minerals, so, so you see here large crystal of olivine and a band of those chromatites, so you get a very nice neat layer of uh, um, this uh, characteristic chromium rich uh, uh, spinel and so you can even recognize some of the eohedral crystals of spinel which uh, sort of illustrate their, their symmetry again this will be mostly octahedral so you have sections of octahedral exposed in, in this particular image um, the lighter color and, and blue color are uh, different compositions of, of Plagioclase because the QEM scan is able to detect also the change in a substitution of sodium versus calcium. I leave you to read this to figure out the different composition of, of the plagioclase, how it changes. Uh, so it, it will go really from more calcic to, to more sodic compositions. Uh, and in this other example, instead, so this I think were from the RAM intrusion. So we can see here the um, RAM layer suite uh, is this image here. And instead the B1, which is this one here, is the Marensky Rift. So I mentioned Marensky Rift. And you can see very much similar thicknesses. Marensky Rift will be a little bit thicker, but we are talking about a few centimeters more really. So it's surprising how these processes operate uh, across different continents in, in pretty much the same fashion uh, which is interesting to learn and uh, we have similar type of accumulation of chromatites uh, so you still see chromatites in here and uh, also some some uh, evidence of uh, uh, pyroxen here in uh, in darker green uh, and still i think it's immersed in uh, uh, the um, likely plagioclase in, in, in this color so let's see if, if I, I can find uh, the correct yes it's plagioclase as, as I was mentioning just to confirm another example here uh, this is a palisade uh, major dike that we find uh, in uh, on the western coast of, of uh, actually eastern coast of the states uh, so this has usually uh, significant macroscopic layering so on the order of 10 meters uh, but this is a type of cryptic uh, layering so you see quite a bit of pyroxene which is in, illustrated here in, in greenish and it will be a transition really in the composition of the pyroxene that uh, governs uh, the um, strength of the rock commonly and uh, also the um, so some of the mechanical properties will be influenced really by, by these variations so it states here that goes from five percent to 25 percent uh, and uh, yeah it's it's influencing the, the resistance of, of the rock probably uh, 
uh, the abundance of pyroxene will be um, critical in terms of alteration. So many times uh, this green is also a process of serpentinization. So you tend to serpentinize mafic rocks. Uh, so the abundance of, of uh, ferromagnesium minerals certainly will promote uh, uh, the um, translation of, of magnesium rich minerals such as pyroxene into um, serpentine which is a soft mineral again so you, you get the point of, of this uh, change in, in mechanical strength it's more uh, related to the um, product of, of weathering of uh, pyroxene rich rocks so this is just to illustrate what I was mentioning earlier so often we have different compositions so we can change the for example magnesium content in uh, a pyroxene so we will substitute magnesium with iron commonly so you have this area here that is um, sort of connecting uh, the uh, enstatite and ferrosilite group basically so we go into hypersthene and, and ferrosilite uh, uh, which are also sort of different uh, uh, percentages of substitution of magnesium and iron. If we increase the amount of calcium, we'll enter into the family of clinoperoxins. Uh, so remember, when you fractionate a magma, you tend to go from orthopyroxin rich rocks, which are more mafic, uh, into more fasic assemblage, which will be will be gabroic and, and they contain quite a bit more clinopyroxene so diopside, edembergite and augites are, are more common in, in gabros and anorthosites this will be more common in your lerzolites and adsburgites so restitic rocks so we go now and, and look at some of the uh, most important examples so we review the bushwell complex and, and still water complexes uh, so if we look at the stratigraphy of um, the volcanism uh, and uh, magmatism in general that occurred in the bushwell complex uh, we see a, a relatively complex assemblage of different uh, magmatic units uh, um, this is true also for uh, for the extent of, of bushwell is we saw that it's very extensive and uh, some authors argue that uh, it is actually um, the result of multiple intrusions what is surprising is that most of the uh, layered sequences that are preserved in the different parts of the bushwell are very consistent uh, in fact we have um, some of the layers uh, such as the Merensky Reef uh, uh, which uh, have been traced for really literally hundreds of, of kilometers across these different uh, um, groups uh, of, of plutons uh, I would say um, so if we look at the stratigraphy in more detail we can see most of the units are quite uh, close in, uh, in age so roughly two billion years uh, with um, sort of a, a, an error that is pretty much within range uh, so many of these units uh, can be considered very close in, in age um, if we look at the compositions of the different uh, units uh, we do see uh, a bi bimodal trend which is kind of similar to the activity that uh, we reviewed for, for Yellowstone, for example. So we got the rhyolites there on the top. We have uh, also ultramafic uh, to mafic compositions in the Rustenburg layered suite. So le the Rustenburg layered suite uh, is the one that really has uh, uh, the critical zone, which is we will see an important part of the layered uh, uh, ultramafic sequence uh, uh, which is very famous because it does contain uh, uh, both chromite and magnetite layers uh, which are 
uh, of economic importance as we stated earlier. So that is again an example of dualism. You can take the loscope formation, rhyolitic, uh, or uh, for example the occurrence of porphyries in the Rashop granophile suite. Uh, all of these uh, are examples of uh, significant uh, uh, partial melting taking place. Uh, so you have uh, both uh, the occurrence of relatively mafic magmas and also felsic compositions which are in line with those models that support the hypothesis that these Archean cratons were influenced by a um, hotspot. And so you have a lot of magma coming from the mantle that interacts with the craton and as a result of that you get distinct magmatism occurring at different levels in the crust and uh, producing characteristic bimodal magmatism, bimodal magmatism. Culminating that are sediments, uh, so many, many of these sequences are blanketed then by sedimentary rocks. Uh, we'll see that in the next uh, uh, slide, next representation, or perhaps the, the other one, but yeah, we tend to have uh, sort of a, ba a basal sequence that is intruded by uh, the ultramafic rocks, uh, which is termed the transvaal sequence, uh, and uh, then we have uh, subsequently the position of the Roiber group, uh, which is again represented by those acid volcanics, uh, and then we enter the, this phase that is mostly mafic to ultramafic, uh, especially at the bottom of the sequence. Uh, which is the Rustenburg layer suite, which contains the majority of the economic mineralization again. And then we go into granophiles, so similar to the Muskok intrusive, we mentioned granophiles as you know, phases that uh, tend to crystallize uh, uh, felsic minerals uh, in coexistence, so for example quartz and felspar, uh, because they are in uh, what is called a particular cotactic, cotactic condition. So you tend to form those uh, granophilic uh, textures uh, which are very similar to the graphic uh, texture we saw in the lab. And then we, we enter a granitic phase and more alkalic phase, so you fractionate even further or have much more crustal contamination. And here you have, of course, the geographic distribution of these units. You see uh, the scale is quite staggering, so a very extensive uh, plateau with the major abundance of, of uh, seals uh, and uh, intrusives uh, that will uh, represent your layered suite, uh, essentially. Here is another image, a similar map that is more uh, informative because it gives you also a cross-section. So you have an east-west cross-section here uh, that uh, shows uh, the uh, Bushwell complex uh, intruding uh, the Transvaal. And uh, you can see the magma source uh, essentially from the mantle which is expected, uh, a crust at thickness of roughly 40 kilometers. So a cratonic setting is reasonable. And then we have granitization at the top with partial mantle that occurs within the crust. So you see this sourcing from the crust of these other later magmatic events. In this map, it is also important to remark the fact that we have lobes uh, forming uh, and these uh, are the ones that contain the majority of the marker units. Uh, so the Merensky Reef uh, is highlighted uh, by this red line uh, that essentially uh, is forming this characteristic western lobe. Uh, 
and then we have the same type of uh, sequence uh, reported also in the eastern part of the Bushwell complex. Uh, so we tend to have at the top of the magmatic sequence a magnetite layer and at the bottom instead we have more chromatic assemblages. Uh, and this is of course the result of fractionation. So more fractionated magmas will tend to have uh, the crystallization of magnetite as so magmatic magnetite will form up essentially in the upper zone of the sequence. We'll see some, some of this information later as well, but this gives you the geographic distribution of uh, uh, these units. So of course because of that the majority of the mining will occur in these regions. Uh, if we enlarge this uh, section we can also illustrate uh, really the stratigraphy of uh, uh, the uh, RLS. So you will get uh, a, a phase that is more a marginal zone which is at the periphery of uh, this intrusion which sits on its eastern part and it's darker here in color and then you move up into the sequence uh, so these are mostly characterized by chill margins uh, so evidence that you have uh, the intrusion interacting with the colder assemblages uh, is a key characteristic of this marginal zone in the lower critical and main zones uh, you get the classical segregation of, of those chromites uh, and uh, uh, also pyroxenites will form quite often. We do not have a lot of olivine in these units. Uh, it is somewhat a characteristic of Bushwell type uh, uh, magmatism. So it looks like uh, a lot of this magma has been already fractionated to a certain stage and has essentially had the removal, significant removal of magnesium and then you have sort of the upper zones with again it's the one that has more magnetite so it says here main, main magnetite layer it will be concentrated on, on the top part of the sequence uh, although there are areas in, in the upper zone where we don't have much magnetite uh, and this is attributed to uh, secondary passes of ultramafic magmas uh, that sort of restarted uh, decrystallization series so, but yeah it's very consistent and so it's it's a good uh, example and it's one of the best studied examples so a lot of the research uh, active research is really going towards understanding the formation of these uh, uh, chromatic layers in, in, in the critical uh, zone for obvious reason because they contain the platinoids uh, and the bushwell has also considerable resources of vanadium which will be in the magnetites so they are titaniferous magnetites which contain vanadium again and also there is in the upper part quite a bit of apatite so it's been considered also for the importance of phosphate although there is no current resource calculations done on, on that aspect um, but yeah, it's, it's uh, potentially an important resource for phosphorus as well. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, what is staggering about uh, the, uh, the deposit is, is really its continuity. So it renders it uh, uh, the largest uh, or at least one of the largest mineral deposits and for, for sure the largest layered uh, intrusion that is known. At, the, at present in the planet. So you have here a, an example of the marginal zone which is again the lowest unit uh, uh, within the layered sequence uh, so the RLS sequence uh, and it's uh, uh, essentially a chill zone which is roughly 150 meter thick by, by chill I'm just showing you here an example of a diabase dike intruding basalt uh, which is which has these glassy chill margins so you, you essentially have 
uh, two aspects when, when you have an intrusion you tend to have uh, the uh, crystallization of very fine grain rocks so aphanitic rocks will form in a chill margin and uh, this is uh, um, very glassy so that's the first aspect of a chill margin and, and also again the grain size will be extremely fine grain and so we tend to have uh, uh, in contrast with this image in uh, the bushwell the, the marginal zone is characterized by this fine grained no rights uh, so you do have essentially gabbros and norites that are very fine grained and this is explained by the fact that the intrusion is interac interacting with the transval and so the temperature of crystallization is uh, decreasing very rapidly because of that If we look at uh, the details of the uh, mineralogical variations in the stratigraphy of the Bushwell complex, uh, so the stratigraphic sequence uh, is represented again by characteristic layering and this is well represented in the eastern lobe of, of the Bushwell complex. Uh, so for sake of simplicity I have listed here some of the main minerals you find in the Bushwell complex in this particular unit and we start commonly with the basal series so quite often very primitive magmas will be found at the bottom and so in the basal series we have mostly dunites and ortho pyroxenites as, as I mentioned earlier we have mostly magnesium rich pyroxenes and, and so if you will have Habsburgitic uh, compositions um, so if you look at this classification here we have percentages of anortite, fosterite, uh, calcium poor, pyroxene, calcium rich, pyroxene and also iron and, and chromium oxide so the abundance of oxides um, so the chromites and magnetites uh, which represents different levels of oxidation so the, usually the more fractionated phases will be more oxidized and so you get more magnetite produced of those and so again again we get into the toleitic uh, toleitic magmas uh, so chromite uh, is more abundant at the bottom of the sequence uh, and uh, yes with these numbers here you get the different proportions of, of magnesium iron and, and calcium present for example in the calcium poop pyroxene so these are more magnesium rich pyroxenes found at the base uh, here of the sequence uh, for instance and this is rather a 50 50 in thermal proportion so we have uh, that the calcium rich pyroxene will have 45% of calcium, 49% of magnesium and then only 6% iron at the bottom so very very rapidly you get uh, the perspective of what we called uh, the cryptic layering so the change in the composition of, of olivine so for example the olivine here it's all forsteritic in composition so you have quite a bit of forsterite present so that's i think to characterize the basal part if we move up uh, we go into the critical series uh, where we have those uh, layers that uh, are represented by mineral mineralized uh, chromites uh, we have mostly uh, a phase layering that is noritic uh, and also contains orthopyroxenites uh, and uh, also anorthosite layers uh, so there is a fine scale layering that is well developed in this uh, critical series uh, 
and uh, yeah these layers are very continuous so they can be either uh, very sharp modal transitions or, or you get more graded uh, um, accumulations uh, with uh, the variations we observed uh, in uh, previous examples that I show of the Marensky Rift uh, so that will be at this level here in terms of compositions of plagioclase we do have a very high concentration of calcium as expected which will drop gradually uh, for the other layers uh, and uh, again the, the first right will drop but is still quite quite tight at this level and then we have dominantly um, magnesium rich pyroxene so for, um, enstatites will be very abundant uh, in, in these assemblages uh, other things uh, I think uh, we are culminating this sequence with, with the chromatites so uh, here we end up finishing the chromatites and in the main zone we essentially lose those uh, so if we look at some example here we have an orthopyroxenite so you have quite a bit of olivine and pyroxene in this uh, assemblage uh, so the pyroxenes are the more shiny uh, they are quite uh, uh, yellowish in color to white uh, and this is a characteristic color of magnesium rich uh, pyroxene so anstatides can be quite uh, um, translucent and also they tend to be relatively um, um, light in color felsic in color even if they are an aeromagnesium mineral um, so that's that's because they have dominantly magnesium and so it's usually the, the iron that will give you the darker coloration which is so typical of other uh, pyroxenes uh, such as the augites for example but yeah it's fairly coarse equigranular rock and uh, yeah it's almost completely represented by pyroxene and a little bit of olivine which will be the anhedral mineral that is more yellowish uh, to greenish in color uh, in certain portion of this assemblage uh, in the Merensky rift which is uh, usually on the order of 150 meter thick uh, we have mostly uh, rhythmic units with uh, cumulus plagioclase, orthopyroxene, olivine and, and chromite which is the most important thing and uh, yeah the famous platinum and palladium and sulfide bearing subunit is essentially an orthopyroxenite uh, uh, with olivine and chromite uh, as, as the minor components uh, so this is chromites are usually a, a major layer as one to five meters and it's remarkably constant again and it can extend for distances in some cases of 550 kilometers or so you see it's, it's a very important marker so these layers here uh, are really uh, representative of key markers uh, for for the mapping of uh, these units uh, so you essentially know where you are when you find the Marensky Rift. Palladium and platinum are usually derived from residual magmas. So remember that sulfides are usually relatively um, incompatible, so they will like to sit in the melt during fractionation. So they are uh, essentially the leftover of, of a highly fractionated uh, ultramafic magma. And so that's also important to know uh, because they will tend to migrate uh, in uh, those uh, um, relatively fractionated units, basically. So they are late stage of the history of crystallization. Of course, if you have multiple phases, you will have to identify the 
relative crystallization series uh, so that you can map where they are located. This is an example of a neurite, so it's very similar to a gabbro, uh, but usually it's a little bit more felsic. And, um, but yeah, the terms are really in overlap. It will be a question of a composition of pyroxene, really. And for the definition, but you do have uh, quite a bit of chromite as well in, in this uh, in this specimen, which uh, will be really in, in the matrix here. And so in, in white, of course, you have the classic plagio clays, uh, and in dark black uh, to um, cream colored or brownish, uh, we have uh, the majority of the Euhydral pyroxene, so you see here a nice basal of a pyroxene. In uh, the main zones, uh, which is the thickest, uh, we have monotonous sequences, mostly hypersthenic gabbros, so orthopyra pyroxene gabbros uh, will be present, uh, and also we have some anorthosites, uh, so cumulus. Olivin and chromite are absent in this uh, particular case because we are entering a more fractionated batch. So magma here will be dominated by more facet composition, more verlitic compositions if you want. So layering in this context will be poorly developed uh, if, if compared to, to lower units uh, but it's uh, also present. Fasic norites uh, versus norites, good example of, of the increase uh, in plagio clays. So if you get to more anorthosite compositions, you end up with uh, more fasic assemblages, and those will be your pyroxens. Uh, and these other examples as much more pyroxene and the more limited proportions of, of uh, fasic materials which again will be your classic plagio clays. Uh, at the top uh, we have magnetite rich assemblages so we turn the chromite into magnetite uh, so we still form oxides but uh, these are dominated by iron and uh, the sequence becomes more layered so it's uh, more um, a, a repeating sequence of anorthosites, gabbros and also diorites uh, at the top so the more intermediate compositions are reached so we have numerous fasic uh, uh, rock types uh, uh, which are representative of late differentiates so if we look at this layer we have lots of data it's quite interesting to see how the plagio clays compared to the basal sequence uh, is getting a lower percentage of anortites uh, so we will end up having more sodic varieties of plagio clays so more alkalic plagio clays will be present so we talk about albites uh, and uh, um, so we go from anortite into albitic compositions uh, and then we have uh, here clearly a, a, a drop in the phosphoritic percentage of olivine so everything is more phyalitic in composition especially in the top part calcium poor pyroxene so the hyperstand so the ort orthopyroxenes basically will be you know much lower in magnesium and so we have a kick in iron again, as mentioned earlier. And we tend to have the calcium-rich pyroxenes, so the algides, the diopsides, um, those pyroxenes will have a shift in terms of uh, composition. So we have a drop in the magnesium again, so we keep uh, the level of calcium significant, but we have a switch between magnesium and iron again. So here we had low iron, here we get high, high iron, low magnesium. So these are examples of 
cryptic layering i've mentioned that because you change the substitution for example in the olivine we substitute uh, iron with magnesium when we move up in the sequence because of the fractionation so we have iron rich olivine in in uh, in the upper zone which is uh, fitting with this um, progressive fractionation and removal of magnesium rich assemblages essentially so the same type of layering is found in other uh, complexes uh, so we have this example uh, close to the border between wyoming and montana in the states you have here a map with with the scale and also the north and uh, yeah if we look at this it's slightly different because it's more deformed so a lot of tectonism occurred uh, which tilted the still water complex uh, vertically so the sequence has been verticalized but this is a good opportunity to see actually the magmatic uh, stratigraphy so you start you know with the metamorphic rocks in the basement uh, and then you, you have the complex that is represented by peridotitic compositions at the base uh, and then you can Again, you see the same thing we see in the Bushwell complex. We get into orthopyroxenites uh, and then we move into more banded series, will be represented by those gabbros. Uh, um, at the base, also, we have granitic rocks, uh, which uh, represent uh, a major distinction for uh, the. Uh, eastern termination of the still water complex uh, so we have the contact with with the basal granites uh, which are actually younger than than the complex itself and this is more a tectonic uh, uh, offset of uh, the uh, geometry uh, and this is essentially represented by these trust faults uh, that interest all this uh, tectonic contact with uh, the basal peridotites uh, so these are not really, they were not really present when the still water complex formed. This is a younger phase that uh, intruded uh, along this major structural corridor. And on this side, uh, there is the same process. So you have many times sliver of younger materials, so Paleozoic and Mesozoic sediments will be uh, forming slivers uh, within uh, uh, the uh, still water complex in response to thrusting, basically. If we look at the um, stratigraphy that we find in the still water complex, uh, it's again a similar story. So we have peridotitic material at the bottom with uh, a classic layering. And so you see here uh, mostly um, cumulates uh, that alternate between olivine and orthopyroxene. And then we have an orthopyroxene zone which terminates uh, this uh, basal part of the series. Uh, in terms of cryptic layering, we can look in this case at the ratio between magnesium and iron. So if you have a lot of magnesium these numbers tends to go up so you see a progressive decrease in the magnesium content and, and relative increase in iron in response to the uh, progressive precipitation and crystallization of olivine so the magmas are essentially getting rid of magnesium through crystallization of olivine in this particular example this phase then uh, progresses and and you get mostly orthopyroxenite depositing in this top layer which is starting to fractionate even further the magma so, so we can move up here and we see how the uh, percentage molar percentage of anortite in the plagioclase is, is also changing dramatically so this corresponds to a trend uh, uh, that is uh, similar to what we saw for the Bushwell complex. So we have a tendency in reducing the amount of uh, anorthitic uh, plagioclase, uh, and uh, this is going from roughly 80% anorthite uh, 
to uh, down to 60% on the top uh, uh, part of, of the still water complex uh, layered sequence. Uh, so the upper banded zone will have less anorthitic composition, so more albitic uh, composition are common uh, in this uh, uh, top uh, uh, sequence. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, modal proportions of the minerals, uh, you do recognize uh, a sharp variation that distinguishes uh, uh, the lower banded zone from uh, the ultramafic uh, series. Uh, uh, so this area, which is part of the lower part of the banded series, uh, is dominated by plagioclase. Uh, so that's a big shift in terms of modal mineralogy. Uh, so we have uh, mostly um, an increase in plagioclase, although this has some transition and variation, so we will have anorthositic layers as well as more uh, sort of mixed compositions that includes uh, mostly clinopyroxene and orthopyroxene together with uh, plagioclase. Um, in the middle banded zone, this uh, becomes even more pronounced, so we have uh, in interlayering of domains that are more characterized by clinopyroxene, uh, which alternate with uh, uh, almost completely anorthositic composition. So we get anorthosites uh, that again are on the order of the 80% uh, modal. And, um, and then we have so with this boundary here, which could be related uh, to a later impulse of magma in which we return to similar uh, modality with respect to the combination of orthopyroxene and, and clinopyroxene which have similar abundances. So, so overall a sequence that is consistent uh, with the what we saw also in the Bushwell complex uh, Now we, we can look at some examples from the still water complex and compare it uh, with the Skyguard intrusion. So this is very rhythmic sometimes. Uh, so you have examples here from still water on the left side uh, in which uh, you know you start to think about what could be the cause of this perfectly r r rhythmic layering. Here it's very constant, you know, in terms of thickness, we do see clearly a, a cyclic repetition in, in the uh, segregation of, of uh, different uh, igneous minerals. So what is causing that? Uh, difficult to say. Um, but yeah, most likely uh, it's uh, a process that is really related with uh, the differences in density that, that are forming when you are crystallizing these rocks. So, so some argues that uh, you have both the um, mineralogical content, so the chemical composition, uh, and so chemical gradients will be present uh, as well as thermal gradients, uh, which uh, can lead to either diffusion or convection. And so the paucity between diffusion and convection will cause some of these rhythmic layers. Um, and these are also connected with changes in chemical composition that takes place uh, across uh, the different uh, um, rhythmites uh, Intermittent layering is also observed in the Skyguard intrusion. So again, you see pretty much a pattern that is consistent across most of the uh, layered intrusives, as the name suggests. So you do have that Bushwell complex, Stillwater complex, and Skyguard manifest very similar uh, patterns. And uh, yes. Uh, Skyguard is slightly different. Uh, you do have again an intrusive, smaller size, 
just a tank 10 kilometers very young uh, intrusive but again you have uh, what is called the middle border series so you have a surrounding magmatic phase that uh, represent your chill margin and uh, you have inward crystallization of of sulfide so of sorry of um, ultramafic rocks so this inward crystallization is is inferred to be related to the ingress first ingress of the magmas uh, in contact with the with the host which is mostly metamorphic rocks uh, of precambrian age and yet inside these you find different uh, uh, zones uh, we distinguish uh, lower middle and upper zones uh, and also an upper border series which would represent the top part of the intrusive sequence uh, and then you have other features uh, that are younger that sort of intrude uh, on, on top or overprint basically these older intrusive phases so, if the Skyguard intrusion shares uh, similarities with Bushwell and the still water, it does also have quite a bit of a difference. Uh, probably one of the most important differences is the size, uh, and that I think has big implication in controlling the crystallization history of, of this intrusion. And so we will see that the crystallization sequence is showing a quite distinctive feature. So keep in mind that recent model, models such as the Salmons and Tegner uh, paper, they, they, they recommend to interpret this as a single surge of, of magma. So we have that uh, a magmatic chamber forms and it get, gets completely field and this is fairly rounded body so it's you can expect it to be a tall magmatic chamber basically relatively tall and uh, yeah this is represented by uh, a, a feature that is quite quite characteristic which is the development of a, a relatively thick uh, so approximately one meter of, of chill margin that is uh, essentially uh, localized at the periphery of, of this uh, uh, pluton. So stratigraphically speaking, so if we look at the stratigraphy of, of the uh, different uh, uh, ultramafic magmas that are crystallized or mafic magma that are crystallizing within uh, the uh, intrusion, uh, we can recognize a major difference between uh, these um, accumulations or accumulates uh, and what we find in the Bushwell complex or, or the other sort of classical examples of ultramafic layered intrusives. Uh, the difference is, is called the sandwich horizon. So we have that the fractionation that is commonly uh, having those very mafic minerals at the bottom then progressively getting more silicic minerals at the top of the sequence with those magnetites it's actually not uh, repeated in the same fashion in multiple cycles in this intrusive so we do have essentially a single pass of magma that interacts with the surrounding host and the rapid cooling is increasing the density and, and causing essentially an ingrowth of uh, the fractionation. So we do have an upward and downward crystallization trend that forms within this intrusive. In particular, the upper border series uh, is crystallizing downward, so you get the more facet parts at the bottom, and instead the uh, layered series uh, is actually more consistent with what we find uh, in the bushwork complex. So here you have uh, these examples So the sandwich horizon would be this interface that separates uh, the upper border series from the layered series. And if, you, if we look at the nitty-gritty here, so we focus on, on sort of understanding things, 
we will recognize the same features that we find in the Bushwell complex for the layered sequence. Uh, so you have here outcrops showing that, so classic uh, sequence uh, of uh, felsic and, and mafic assemblages with, with a, a sharp change in the modern mineralogy, so getting for more pyroxenitic layers into more anorthitic uh, varieties or anorthosetic layers. Um, um, the interaction with the host is well evident because you find these embayments that shows that the magma was actually adapting to uh, some of the surrounding rocks, uh, so filling essentially some of the topographic depressions. Uh, and so we see here an example of, of those interactions uh, when the intrusive is, is really at the contact with uh, the metamorphic assemblages. Uh, Here is an old picture that was trying to explain this uh, major distinction in crystallization phases. So you see, uh, going from sort of olivinic and pyroxenitic layers, we move up in the sequence and guess we get uh, compositions that are more cl clinopyroxens so or compositions and apatites coming into the system. And so Definitely, this is a sequence that is consistent with what we find in the Bushwell complex with a loss essentially of magnesium and an increase in iron. Iron rich pyroxene, you know, iron rich olivine, all those aspects will be uh, consistent. Um, uh, the difference is in the upper border series because we have olivine and plagioclase at the top, so troctolytic compositions occur in the top part and then you go down and you find your apatites here so oxidized magmas uh, that uh, will crystallize uh, your uh, apatites uh, uh, which are phosphates uh, again of calcium so increases uh, in, in uh, uh, iron rich olivine as well are, are well evident so you can see here the proportions of of forsterite, so the magnesium rich olivine, and so they are higher at the top and then they drop down, and so that means you get more iron into the olivine, which substitutes for the magnesium. If we look at a better and more recent diagram that illustrates the same concept but use a ratio between magnesium and iron, perhaps this is easier to understand, you can see clearly an increase uh, in uh, um, the uh, amount of iron while we progress towards uh, the uh, sandwich horizon, because here the scale is inverted, so be careful. This is, doesn't mean that you have an increase in magnesium, uh, so this figure represents the percentage of magnesium versus iron, essentially. Or it could be interpreted as anortite compositions so or calcic plagioclase, and we do see uh, a progressive decrease in the abundance of anortite while we move up the series. So the plagioclase gets more enriched in sodium, for example. Um, in terms of the ingress of minerals, uh, we can see uh, the ingress of apatite here quite late in the sequence, which is consistent. Uh, and also we can see uh, this uh, sort of persistence of olivine also in the upper part, uh, which is quite uh, a remarkable and a distinction if compared to uh, what we observe in the Bushwell complex. Uh, so hopefully this gives you a, a, a sort of a better uh, understanding of, of the variation in the composition of felsic and mafic minerals. Uh, and so this is a form of cryptic layering again. So if, if you think about the origin of the rhythmic uh, layering a little bit better, we can appeal to similar processes we have uh, two things really that are critical. One is the formation of new layers by gravity resettling. So many times we have a differential density that is 
caused by the crystallization process itself. So we tend to increase the density using gravity. But that, of course, doesn't apply always. So, so we have also other, other factors. And one is temperature, which will uh, so control the convection and overturning. So the turbulence, essentially, that we find uh, in a magmatic chamber is often related to these thermal gradients. Uh, and so convective overturn will take uh, will will basically remove the late magma and re-homogenize re re the magma, forming essentially a set of cycles. Uh, and these of course at different levels, uh, uh, which partly explains some some of the rhythmic layering uh, that is often observed. Uh, each cycle is uh, more evolved, so when you move up, of course, you get multiple convection systems, but they are remixing magma that has a different uh, fractionation level, so they will have uh, a resulting uh, correspondence with uh, the rhythmites that we find, uh, for example, in, in the middle zone, in the bush well, as well as in, in the upper zones where, where you tend to have the, the uh, rhythmites uh, that are represented by pyroxenites uh, and norites. Some examples here of non-uniform layering. So we do have situations in which uh, the layering will be rather more complex. And again, this is linked with the turbulence. Uh, and convection systems. Uh, so you might have also new passes of magma that will erode some of the existing layering that, uh, that formed. And so effectively we can form unconformities that are entirely uh, the result of magmatism. So we will remove some of the existing beds uh, and we can also reorient them forming again unconformities. And you have a good example of that here where we find a surface that is truncating these layers. Uh, and then we have another secondary deposition uh, with uh, evidence of grading uh, of uh, these uh, particular uh, layers. Uh, here is a similar concept. We, we can recognize cross bands uh, uh, which are in accumulate. Uh, so these are coming from uh, the uh, sky guard again so we will have situations in which uh, we can have uh, lateral flows uh, within the chamber that uh, support this idea that there is horizontal movement of magmas uh, in uh, these magmatic chambers so this is also consistent with some of the synthetic modeling so you have an example here of a silicon based model in which we have a temperature gradient uh, and so we can see the migration of plumes uh, of uh, silicon that gets essentially in, into areas that are colder at the bottom so of course when you're cooling a material you increase its density and you have by gravity the migration of the colder material uh, into deeper levels. Uh, so this is how you originate plumes. Uh, it is very similar to what we found uh, when we were discussing the uh, differentiation of, of earth uh, and uh, uh, it explains well why you get differential densities uh, across the planet which have been proved again by using geophysical techniques. Uh, so this is how the material is reshuffled basically within the magmatic chamber at different levels uh, and it will uh, lead to compartments uh, that have uh, essentially separate uh, convective cells. Uh, in this case we are crystallizing different minerals in the different domains again in relationship to the fact that we have different levels of fractionation depending on density and temperature conditions. So effectively this process uh, uh, often will lead to uh, the development of uh, nonlinear patterns uh, which are those bands. Uh, so banding is 
again a process that is, is linked to this uh, re-equilibration and differentiation and it explains also the separation of the outer core from the mantle and from the crust itself so even the earth is layered and this occurs at different scales so it will occur also within intrusives so in this particular case then we have this bimodal pattern forming but what happens uh, you know when we start crystallizing things we will get even more patterning forming so more segregation layers so, so we'll have quite a bit of pyroxene quite a bit of olivine forming at the bottom of these convective systems uh, and this will uh, essentially change the internal density and form a density gradient also within these cells uh, which is uh, explaining this periodicity that we find because after some time uh, you do essentially get a situation in which uh, the density of these units will be very similar to the density of these other lobes uh, and so you create what is called an instability and mixing will take place uh, this mixing explains uh, why we tend to have uh, uh, combinations of pyroxene and olivine for example or why we have exclusive pyroxenitic layers or exclusively anorthitic layers so situations that have dunites, asburgites and orthopyroxenites can be explained through the differentiation and the progressive equilibration of density, temperature and chemical gradients as well so it's a fairly complicated process of course but yeah, it's sufficient that you understand uh, that it's usually uh, the density and the temperature gradients uh, so the dissipation of heat that are controlling the patterning that we observe so when you have uh, separation of pyroxene rich magmas uh, you will form orthopyroxenites uh, when you have a mixed situation so we do have uh, that uh, the melt that contains uh, dominantly pyroxene reaches because of the convection and fractionation a density that is very close to a dunite so you form a cumulate basically a pyroxene rich cumulate uh, this will get closer to the top of the dunite sequence and so it will mix with it uh, and so you get also this asburgite forming We're left with the last example of, of a major igneous complex. It's not far from us. We are essentially sitting uh, here in uh, uh, the eastern part of the Sunbury Basin. And uh, we can see a characteristic annular shape, uh, which is uh, an indication of a major impact that occurred uh, and yes, it has been speculated and, and actually proved that, that uh, an asteroid impacted uh, in this location uh, roughly 1.8 billion years ago. So proterozoic times uh, and uh, mostly we find uh, similar things uh, in uh, uh, this uh, condition, but the origin of the ultra mafic layer complexes here which are termed, termed the SIC, so Sudbury in Igneous Complex, uh, it's remarkably different from what uh, we uh, sort of uh, inferred for the other classic uh, layered intrusions. So this, you think of Sudbury as something that is a bit different uh, because of its relationship to this major synchronous impact. Uh, and so, in a way, you will still have a significant amount of magmatism that takes place because of the impact. So remember, if you have a very large asteroid, quite often you have displacement so high of mass that you produce incredible amount of energy. And this energy is able to melt crust and also mantle if the impact is, is highly significant. And so the result of that is uh, 
the, this differentiation that is induced by the impact basically because you still have quite a bit of magmatism in response to uh, this event. So if you look at the structure here, we have similar rock types, so we do get granite fires forming, no rights at the bottom, but you see it's, it's a little bit more fractionated here, the situation, so we don't get those dunitic layers, which is an indication, you know, that uh, we are melting quite a bit, quite a bit of the lava canise to produce this this type of rocks. So we have crustal rocks, metamorphic rocks uh, of variable composition that will influence the type of melting that we find uh, in in the Sudbury Basin. Um, so of course, uh, this is uh, has been tectonically deformed. Uh, so we have series of thrusting on the uh, southeastern side of, of uh, the basin which is in contact uh, with uh, uh, so put in contact with the superior province with the Iranian supergroup uh, but yeah it's important to, to sort of flag the fact that we still have a stratified sequence uh, so here you have a summary of this 1.8 GA impact uh, it shows you with this sequence of images, the evolution of the crater that was formed. So we have quite a bit of melting taking place, ejecta forming, which uh, forms some of those rocks we saw in the lab uh, when we were talking about breaches. Uh, so we can form breaches that uh, are the result of an impact, uh, and uh, they have quite unique composition because of the nickel they contain. So nickel, copper, sulfides are present in these uh, Sudbury breaches, which are called the Onapin breaches. Uh, uh, usually you have also melted rocks that form, so the breacher can form also melted assemblages, uh, which will look like obsidians, uh, and uh, often you get also spherulites forming as a result of the vitrification process. Uh, and this can travel significantly and can be used to mark and date the age of uh, uh, impact of, of an asteroid, uh, which is also quite important. Many times also at the bottom we tend to have the formation of uh, characteristic uh, uh, structures, so some of them will, will be called horse tail structures, which are high pressure deformation features which often are exceeding the 30 gigapascals when you have very large impacts, which are quite unique and distinguish uh, these uh, rocks uh, or these highly deformed rocks from what you see in volcanic explosions. Uh, so much higher energies, even higher than, than big Plinian eruptions, uh, are actually uh, generating the, the magmatism and, and, and some of the textures we find in this type of uh, impact related features. So breaches will be quite abundant, the onaping, onaping is here, uh, I've actually visited this site and, and saw quite a bit of those features of what I was mentioning uh, a few years ago. Um, other aspects are uh, the unique uh, fact that we have a lack of rhythmical layering so it's dramatically different from Skygar, Bushwell and Stillwater so we don't see the same type of rhythmites units are more homogeneous uh, uh, compositions uh, within Gramophile and Norite are quite uniform as well so you don't see that cryptic, cryptic layering that we saw for, for those major ultramafic deposits. Uh, and then we have this quartz gabbro, which is anomalous in uh, its mafic nature, which is found at the center of, of the body. So the complex also formed at extremely high temperatures, so that's also an important thing to, to remember. So 
similar temps to coma, the heights magma, so 1600 to 1700 degrees. Uh, and uh, of course, since it, it is an impact, uh, we get a single magmatic event. We don't have multiple injection of more primitive magmas, which could explain partly the large scale absence of layering. So you see here the different stages that have been postulated uh, for the uh, formation of Sudbury. So we had uh, an, an instantaneous melting of, of a large amount of rock, uh, which was part of uh, the uh, metamorphic basement. And so you get vaporization and form this spherulitic uh, accumulation. So, so which are the results of emulsions uh, of uh, uh, magma, basically. So immiscibility will, will form those spherical patterns. Uh, so the example of those spherules uh, of nickel and uh, copper will be uh, remarkable evidence of this process. Uh, so they get you know, eroded, brecciated away, they can get uh, uh, um, trapped within breaches, uh, like the example uh, we discussed. But yeah, at some stage, these will be a density imbalance, so, so you tend to have a phase in which you start to form your norites and granophyre, which has, are the result of uh, uh, the uh, gravity settling of the more dense phases. Uh, so there is a, a viscosity contrast as well as an immiscible, immiscible aspect of the liquids that will contribute to this separation. So I make here the example of water and oil, which certainly is a good fit uh, because they are not easy to mix together. And so this led to this large, very large layering. Here is another picture that shows the same process, really. So we got a mixture of rocks, combination of intrusives, metamorphic rocks. And this was, and also sedimentary rocks on top here. So we have a crustal target, basically. So crust, heterogeneous crust, and we impact that, vaporize everything, and form this emulsion. So a, a, a very complex mixing of all these different compositions in a melted state. And then you start having this major separation in two layers and convection that also contributes to a, a different separation uh, of uh, a crystal settling occurring in the different domains. So that will be controlled, of course, by vigorous convection that occurs in separated layers. The last part of, of the sequence of events that led to the present stratification of the Sudbury Basin um, it's uh, essentially a phase of cooling, so you expect to have convection and redistribution of magmas uh, when you have temperatures that are on that order of 1600, but uh, if you go down and reduce the temperature, we see that uh, when we are at 700 roughly for a magma, we enter a phase in which we get uh, almost complete solidification, so we stop the convection and we start a phase of, of differentiation. So we will have solidification fronts, essentially, building up progressively and deformation of, uh, again, cumulates, uh, uh, which uh, will then constitute major compositional variations. So in, in this context, then, we have uh, three major units that we can identify uh, in, in terms of magmatic assemblages. One is the granophires, uh, which tend to be particularly rich 
in Palazzo Clays at the top uh, and are culminated by the on pin rock, so these are breaches uh, and uh, they are uh, sort of going into a transition zone and uh, into uh, no rights, so where you find basically all the quartz, gabbros and no rights uh, and uh, uh, then you essentially have uh, the direct contact with the basement uh, which is represented by, by football uh, granitic assemblages. So this concludes uh, this 10th uh, lecture that discussed uh, various examples of uh, layered intrusions of ultramafic and mafic composition again. Um, I think this is really a, a conclusive lecture that wraps up uh, pretty much uh, all we have to say with respect to igneous rocks. Uh, so from the next uh, lecture we move uh, into the sedimentary world and uh, we are going to discuss uh, those other type of rocks, uh, so focus more on uh, all the processes that lead to the formation of sedimentary rocks.